Okay. Okay, yeah. Um, I'm like getting ahead of myself because I would just want to jump into this, um, this book, all the scandal and drama and love and violence and, and historical facts and figures, actually. Um, Dr. Natasha Gordon Chip. And I'm gonna just call you that the entire time. Like, please don't try to stop me. Uh <laughs> I was just gonna say, why don't you call me Natasha? I know I, you were ready to like, you know, grab my little little connect and bun just now, but I I look, I just have to <laughs> because that's what that's what your name is, and that's what that's what you did. That so um yes, Javier. Uh actually, Dr. Javier Wallace who he will also probably pull my connect alarm button too. <laughs> but I mean, the, the, that PhD journey is no joke. So like, you know, hats off to y'all because we already know how these spaces are pretty damn violent in general and specifically to black people and specifically to dark skinned black people. Um, we also have, we have another, we have Dr. Nicole Ramsey in the building or in the virtual building. Um, shout out to y'all. Shout out, big up yourself. Big up yourself. <laughs> but um, I, I do want to ask you about the writer's retreat and I'm pulling up your bio now, um, but can you please, Dr. Natasha Gordon Chipperberry, <laughs> I personally am getting, I'm getting the kick out of it. Please don't take it away from me. Um, but your writer's retreat, you have this writer's retreat in Costa Rica since 2015 if I'm not mistaken, right? And it's, I am thirsty, tengo said retreat. Can you tell us a little bit about that retreat? Cause I'm about to like sign up like the next time you have it. Well, I need to disappoint you a little bit, Dash. Um, I have a two year waiting list already. <laughs> and I so there's no nepotism. We'll talk, we'll talk, we'll talk, we'll talk, we'll talk. all right. Uh, hello, everybody. So yes, Tangle said, actually, it was a very um, sort of selfish endeavor at first, because when I got to Costa Rica eight and a half years ago, I realized that I wanted to, I was right, I wanted, I started this book, so it's been eight years, um, and I really wanted to write in community, and there were some really important people, writers around me, in Brooklyn specifically and in other spaces that I was like, wow, wouldn't it be amazing if my friends basically and people I didn't know, but you know, like-minded spirits could venture to Costa Rica and we could write together. And so definitely Michelle is one of the first, um, one of the first people, she's the, the original OG. <laughs> from that group in 2015, in January 2015. And um, we went to uh, uh, a finca uh, uh, farm in on the Caribbean coast in Sikiris. And we wrote and we communed, we danced. I mean, it was pretty incredible. But what I realized is that I wanted a sacred space that was very curated um, for for people of color, for writers of all genres and all levels. Um, so you could be a beginner, you could just be an academic, you could be a creative writer, you could be a poet, um, but a space of safety. And then I transitioned, I've had six of them already, and I transitioned to um, a, re a retreat space, a wellness center that is on the Pacific coast, um, overlooking the Pacific ocean, and it's in the mountains of Atenas. And that space, I, I was specifically committed to it because one, I was like, we do not inhabit those spaces, right? Those spaces of luxury, of beauty, but we should. And so I wanted to really be like, you know, amplify our presence in that space. And let me tell you, it's something powerful when you're sitting around the table with like 13 or 14 black women who are all PhDs, who are all academics at the top of the food chain, basically in academia, there's something about being in that space that's incredibly important. And I also really wanted to have a space of beauty. I was like, why can't we be in beautiful places? We deserve that, right? It can't just be oppression and be in service all the time to others without replenishing ourselves. So I took a hiatus for this January, this coming January 23, because of the book. 
but I am going to open shop again and calls um, and basically go to my wait list first. And then if there are spots, I, cop, I cap at 15. If there are spots, we can have a conversation. <laughs> Like I asked, there ain't no never to, no, I'm, I'm kidding. Um, I respect your, <laughs> your rules. Um, that sounds amazing. Um, I think, and I, I have to find this quote. I read this quote years ago and I believe Derek Walcott said that there's something to be said about the beauty of the Caribbean in um, Afro-descendant resistance and survival. And I, I had read it, read it in somewhere um, and I, I have to locate it, but it was when I was taking a walk um, in Panama and it was early morning and, you know, the sky is really beautiful, the, you know, when after it rains and I was just, I just stood in awe, like, wow, this is really, this is really beautiful. And it, you know, just like you said, the, your surrounding environments, the fact that, you know, you, we do have, or rather the white imagination has, um, has always placed blackness in the forests, in the mountains, in the rivers. And, you know, you can say that it is a stereotypical stigma and trope, but there is some truth to that, that we had been regulated to these public spaces, but also that in a lot of our traditions, we are in re reciprocity with nature. We are and belong to the land. And so um, I want to, on that theme, on that note rather, um, I just want to quickly introduce myself. I'm Dash. Um, I am the co-founder of Afro Latinx Travel. Um, I am also the producer director of Negro, a docu-series about Latinx identity. Um, I'm part of a collective called Rayo Caña Negra, where we discuss anti-Blackness in the Latine community. And I also, with Afro Latinx Travel, which the other half is right here in this virtual chat, um, Dr. Javier Wallace, <laughs> um, we give in Black Latin American history and contemporary topics classes. And our next class is in, or rather our next course um, is in November, November 7th, 8th, and then the following week. Um, so it's four classes. And actually there's some alum alum in this virtual chat who, who took our classes. Um, and Afro Latinx Travel has been in existence for a few years now. Uh, we celebrate we embrace we love we 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 are very um attuned to the normativity of blackness in latin america because that is indeed who we are and what we live and i am really delighted to have um dr natasha gordon chippenberry tonight and also we have in the house the other half of afro latinx travel and also the founder of black austin tours um, Dr. Javier Wallace, you want to say hi to the people, the people them? People them. Good evening, everybody. Um, Javier Wallace here, as Dash mentioned, the other part of Afro Latinx Travel and also the founder of Black Austin Tours. Um, I'm so excited to be here this evening and hear from mi hermana, my sister, Dasha, Dr. Natasha Gordon Chippenberry and this wonderful book, La Negrita. I think once I first heard of La Negrita actually was through interacting with Dr. Gordon Chippenberry through the University of Texas at Austin. And it then became my mission with the days that I left, that I had left in Costa Rica to travel to Cartago to view this, to view this Madonna um, and, and have a better understanding of what she was telling us in this course. So I'm just so amazed and happy that this story that I've heard about through her um, over the course, I guess maybe five years, no, not that long, but probably maybe five years ago five years. has now come into fruition and become a book and something that I hope and plan to use throughout <clears throat> my educational journey and sharing knowledges with young people um, and people from around the globe that this work can come back and reconstruct narratives and bring life and like Dash is saying, the drama, the all the scandal too, to these everyday people. So congratulations to Dr. Natasha Gordon Chippenberry on this project and having completed it. Um, and thank you for sharing with us this evening. And I'm excited to uh, hear what you have to share and any comments that are generated from the chat. And thank you Dash for pulling this all together and extending our platform and our reach to the people who, who deserve it and we can do anything to serve them. So thank you, thank you, and good evening, everybody. All right, Zeke and Javier, thank you. Um, 
No, the the thing. No, I live for drama. Like I like if you know me, like I like my sister was named. My mom learned English watching soap operas in English, and my sister's name actually is from a soap opera actress, <laughs> Deidre Hall. And so my sister's name is Deidre. <laughs> like so, you know that this is this is passed down. This is matrilineal with the drama. But um, I am going to um read your bio. Um, which is a very short bio because just knowing this is a little little snapshot really of Dr. Natasha Gordon Chippenberry is a professor of African diasporic literature. She is the author of Representation and Black Womanhood, The Legacy of Sarah Bartman, published by Palgrave. And her writing has been published in Essence Magazine, in Fico Times, as a monthly series, Musings from an Afro Costa Rican. She is a senior co-editor with Dr. Eduardo Paulino of the Afro-Latino Diaspora's book series from Palgrave, where they prioritize the voices of emerging Afro-Latino scholars. Her current writing focuses on slavery and the legacy of Afro-descendants in Latin America. Gordon Chippenberry is the founder and host of the annual Tengo Said Writing Retreats in Costa Rica, an exclusive week-long gathering of global BIPOC writers in Costa Rica. She was born in New York, year to Costa Rican Panamanian parents and moved to Costa Rica seven years ago with her husband and two children. And actually that is my first question. Why did you move to Costa Rica? This was seven years ago? Yeah, so- Eight, okay, eight, eight years ago now. Not eight years now. Why yeah. did you, you were living in, in New York and you 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 were like, I buy, like I'm out of here, I'm going to Costa Rica. Like well, enough was- with y'all rats and the rent. I'm done because <laughs> that's the reason why- Definitely I'm- the rats. <laughs> The rats and the rent. <laughs> right. Um, okay. So it was it was very intentional, actually. Um, it wasn't, you know, I always say that we left by choice, not by force, right? Which is a really interesting way in thinking about how Afro-descended people particularly got into the Americas, right? By by force, not by choice. Um actually read something the other day that said if slavery, the transatlantic slave um experience did not happen, eight out of 10 Afro-descended people would still be in Africa. And I mean, it, it, that's a, it, it's a staggering um, thought, but here we are. And so um, I, well, my husband and I decided that in looking at the temperature, we were right at sort of the end of Obama. Right. So we had had these years, our children had been raised, you know, Michelle and the girls and essentially feeling reflected right in in powerful spaces, um, particular powerful political spaces. They 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 would see that. And so. Um, but my husband and I kind of knew it was a, it was a false reality, because if we just took if we were realistic and looked at the history of the United States in many ways, we could see what was coming. Right. Um, and so in many ways, the kind of backlash or the payback for having, you know, a black president um, and a black family in the seat of power, we understood that it was going to essentially be um, a reign of terror in trying to reconstruct whiteness in the United States. And so in saying that, we made a decision to, because my, my mother's Costa Rican, my father's Panamanian, um, but they live in New York. And so we made a decision to come to Costa Rica. Um, I have a large extended maternal family here in San Jose. Everybody is from Limon, from the Caribbean coast, but everybody now lives in and around San Jose. And um, we just, we, you know, came to visit and we looked at some schools for the kids. And once we found a place for them, we essentially looked for some rentals around their school. And we had made a decision because we, we you know, packed everything up in a storage, a storage room for a year. And we made a decision on, you know, the kids and taking, taking their temperature on how they liked Costa Rica. So we wanted to try it for a year. And, but even though I have to say my husband, Masuko and I kind of were like, mm, we, we bought one way tickets, but nonetheless, if the children, I mean, come on, we're adults, right? Um, if the children had really, really, you know, th- if they didn't cope, if they didn't do well here, if they didn't farm, uh, form partnerships and friendships, and, you know, I mean, if they did not feel acclimate, then we would have made other decisions, right? Honestly, because um, that was our priority. But 
they loved it. They, my children are fully bilingual. They have lifelong friends here. We have a dog. We have, you know, so we are fully ingrained here. Um, and I and I have to say that both of my children will say this was the best decision of, you know, that we've made as a, as a family and as a collective. And they are very grateful to live in Costa Rica, not only with their extended family, but also with the friends they've created and the lifestyle that we have, you know, things that we could, the safety, I'm going to say that. Um, and we can be fully inside of our blackness, but we can also be fully inside of our humanity, right? So we're not working with um, the idea of always just being defensive in terms of being black or thinking about random acts of violence. And that's incredibly important. It was one of the reasons that Costa Rica was a choice. And I think that for my husband and I, we both made, wanted to make a commitment to prioritize our creativity. And so that's why I started this book. Thank you for that. <clears throat> um, I wanna start, good segue into the actual book. The book is called Finding La Negrita. And so I, I had always described La Negrita as a Black Madonna because there are various Black Madonnas throughout Latin America. Um, there's one in Cuba. I know there's one in Ecuador. Um, someone had commented on the event link that there's one in Spain. I was like, there's various Black Madonnas. Um, and particularly in Costa Rica, you have, this is the Nuestra Señora de los Ángeles, right? Or the Virgin of Our Angels, yes. I guess. Um, and why did you, actually, let me, let me ask the first question. Who is La, La ne Negrita? Okay. Um, so yes, La Negrita is essentially the, the communal, the local name for what we call the, the Black Madonna or La Virgen de los Angeles, which is the patron saint of Costa Rica, right? Can you all hear me? I'm just wanting to make sure that everybody can hear me. I'm holding the microphone. I just wanna make sure like, okay, good. Um, so what, what ends up happening according to lore, right? And the Catholic church that obviously has a narrative because if you look, whether you go to Spain, whether you go to Mexico, whether you go to wherever you find a black Madonna, the narratives by the Catholic church are pretty much the same in terms of finding this icon, building a church and et cetera, et cetera. So one of the things that's really interesting is that Costa Rica had, um, you know, by the 17th century had uh, slavery, Right? Slavery existed in Costa Rica for over 200 years. Um, but it's interesting, the form of slavery they had is, is not in alignment with what we understand as sort of the plantation slavery, the sugar canes, uh, tobacco, cotton of the US South, or even into the, you know, into to the rest of the Americas. And so Costa Rica did not have a cash crop. However, so what ended up happening was there were three sort of areas that enslaved people worked in, right? So they worked cattle ranching in the north, um, the domestic servitude in Cartago, which was the colonial capital, and then cacao farming on the towards the Caribbean, right? And um, most of the enslaved people who came came in small bunches, and they came through Puerto Bello in Panama, right, which was a major slave port. Um, and so what ends up happening, the, according to the Catholic Church and according to popular lore, uh, a free Black woman, because yes, um, there were enslaved people of African descent in Costa Rica, right? But there, were also, there was also a free Black and mixed race community that lived right alongside those who were enslaved, right? So freedom was always tenuous. Um, and I think that, that was what, that's one of the major ideas that I try to present in the book. But anyway, um, so this free um, parda, which is the word for free black parda, um, it goes to the forest, sees this icon. Um, it's a carving, very small carving of a mother, the Virgin Mary and child um, takes it home and then basically it disappears. So she goes back to the forest to the same place she finds the icon on day one. It's back there again day two. She takes it home. It disappears. Day three, it's the same story. So on day three, once it disappears again, she then goes to the local parish priest, the Catholic priest, and basically says, this is what's happening. And 
Um, he also has the experience. He takes, he goes and takes the icon, tries to put it into the church. It disappears and it goes back into the forest. And so he decides right then and there that in that forest space, that is where um, a, 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 a temple or a, a place of worship will be made for this icon. So that's sort of the Catholic lore around it. Now, what's really interesting is that for a large majority of this time, after 1635, the Catholic Church commissioned a community of free Black men who lived in Puebla de los Pardos, which is the area where the free Blacks lived and uh, mixed race people lived as long as they were free. Um, the, he can, the Catholic Church commissioned this group in order to sort of take care of the veneration of, of this Black Madonna, because there was some, there was some thought that, that maybe perhaps only the Blacks would be interested in her, right? And then, of course, one of the major issues is that the Catholic Church begins to complain about the type of veneration that gets performed, right? So, you know, I mean, the, the music and the dance and the celebration and the drums and, uh, you know, I mean, so it's like, okay. And then what happens is once independence comes, the Catholic Church makes a decision uh, very similar to sort of, and I always link this up to sort of South African um, Afrikaners, right? This idea of what do I need in order to create this national identity? And so what they do is after 200 years, essentially they go into Puebla de los Pardos they remove la negrita, which means literally the little black one, right? That's been venerated for 200 years by this black community. And then essentially they use her and transform her. They whiten her into la Virgen de los Angeles, the Virgin of the Angel to become the patron saint. The national day of, in the country is August 2nd for her veneration and a massive basilica you know, is, is created and she's placed inside the Basilica. And so I guess for me in the, the main question that I have always had, and it's been in conversations with my mother who's Costa Rican, you know, we always discuss this fact that, it, you know, she grew up in Costa Rica, she went to the University of Costa Rica, but slavery was not an educational discussion point, right? And we were sort of like, oh yeah, there were a couple of enslaved people, but then eventually, you know, once independence came, they kind of got absorbed. I love that word, right? Absorbed into the, um, into the human, you know, into the pool, right? And so they're just, they're ticos, they're Costa Ricans. And, you know, she, yeah, my mom was like, no, there's not really, you know, slavery in that sense. And so I just said, well, how is it possible that, there's 200 years of slavery. It's not part of a national narrative. It's not part of the, uh, a historical impetus, but the whole country shuts down in veneration for a black Madonna. Every single year, there are pilgrimages all through the country to the Basilica where people walk the last like meters into the church on their knees in veneration and supplication. And it's incredibly powerful. Any place, like you go to a pulperia in Costa Rica, usually by the cashier, there is the icon, right? Or a picture behind. So she is very much part of the country. So I was trying to reconcile that. I was trying to answer that question. How do people face blackness in that way? and thinking about legacy and presence and the Afro descended people who were enslaved, but also, you know, um, they continue to have a legacy in Costa Rica. And they're very different than when people say, oh, Afro Costa Ricans. They think of the people who came as free laborers and immigrants from the Caribbean. They're not thinking of essentially the people who founded the nation alongside the Spaniards in the 17th century. Right. Yeah. And as you're talking, it makes me think of the the Black Jesus that we have in Portobello, in Panama, which Portobello, as you mentioned, was a major transit point still, is, or rather not Portobello itself to this day, but Panama um, had been and still is a major transit point, but particularly Portobello, um, where you had the um, that transit from Atlantic to Pacific and the Atlantic and Pacific um, human trafficking and enslavement because, and Javier and I always talk about this, how people, um, you know, rightly so, 
um, concentrate on the Atlantic where you had slavery on the Pacific as well. And Panama facilitated that movement or rather the, 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 um, the terrain from Atlantic to Pacific um, adjudicated that transfer of goods and people. And the fact that location and, and the, the black woman wanting to be in the forest is the same type of language they use for the black, the black Christ, the black Jesus that he wanted to be in Portobello. Like he just kept coming, coming back. And so it makes me think of like the, <laughs> the steadfastness of blackness, like, nah, I'm staying here. That's number one. And then number two, how um, I wanted to ask you about, and really this comes up that the, the one thing that we have to keep in, keep in mind, and I say this all the time, the Catholic church doesn't get enough smoke for me um, as it relates to the transatlantic slave trade. They were one of the, I mean, most of the directives, or I should say a lot of the directives on how to, how to enslave um, came from the Pope. <laughs> it came from Papal Bulls. And so, um, you know, what you said about putting the little black one or la negrita, um, it was a way for subjugation to be for Afro descendants to become subjects of the church, subjects of the crown. Um, and I, I giggled when you were talking about the type of veneration that the state had a problem with, because from my observations, from my lived experiences, bl <laughs> black people gonna worship <laughs> like, when it's when it's time. Um, and this reminds me of when, like Javier, when he went to the drum ceremonies, um, the the Yoruba drum ceremonies in 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 Cuba. He was like, "This reminds him." What did you say, Javier? Of the revival services that you that you used to go to, or I guess you still do. You go to in in Texas, just the celebration and the the drums and you know this this exchange of energy because that's also integral in it, this, um, the energy that you're, you're getting from these venerated people. Um, and so this goes to my next question, um, this, these acts of veneration, how you said um, people travel near and far on their needs. And I could just imagine because they do that with the black Jesus here in Panama. They do that with San Lazaro in Cuba, which is um, the mass for Babaluaye. And, you know, they put hot oil on themselves. They'll like um, beat themselves, which is the Catholic way. I know that that's, you know, a common practice in Catholicism. But the fact is, is that these saints are for, you know, the Catholic church instituted them as for the blacks, right? Or for the mixed race or for the non-whites. And so these are folks who are making these pacts and promises with these saints, like, look, my, you know, my family members on their deathbed, or I need this job, or we will die. These are, these are life and death um, packs that people are making. And I completely get why people, you know, go through those lengths, because as you mentioned, like, um, the Black stories, because it's not singular, um, is ever encompassing. And a lot of it has to do with labor. Um, and so, I know that you said you 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 made a pilgrimage to see La Negrita. Why did you feel called to write about her specifically? Because I think I wanted to get to figure out the sort of the historical presence of blackness in Costa Rica. And in many cases, it centered around her story. Right. And so in writing this book, I used her as sort of this thread. Right. So the title of the book is in, is particular finding La Negrita, but it's a process of finding. It's a process of journey. It's a process of movement. It's a process of forming identity. So she is sort of the directive. But in many cases, it is about walking through the journey for these multiple characters. And I really wanted to find, um, I really wanted to honor, I think more than anything else, I really wanted to honor the, the people who are not written in history, the people who are not remembered, the Afro descendants who venerated her for 200 years, who had to live, you know, in Puebla de los Pardos, in, you know, and they had to essentially negotiate livelihoods with the colonial center of Cartago, 
right? And that's one of the reasons that I wanted to, you know, just figure out, well, who are these people? You know, can I, can I imagine these people and their lives and what freedom meant for them? And that's, I think, why I'm so interested in La Negrita, but also the community of Afro descendants who lived in that time period. And um, also, Javier, if you have any questions, you can chime in as well. Um, um, but uh, this idea of freedom really has been has been like in my throat for the past year. Um, you know, I do a lot of research and reading, and there was one particular time where I, you know, and this I've read this a billion times, but I don't know why it came up that day. But I was reading a sentence that it said so-and-so gave them their freedom. And I'm like, gave them their freedom. And I, I like, I stopped and I was like there for like 20 minutes, like gave them their freedom. I'm like, the fact that someone, that, that freedom was commodified in that way that somebody has to give you your freedom, um, it's mind blowing to think about. And as I was reading the book, that that tension, the ne negotiation, like you said, freedom was tenuous, freedom is precarious. And, but the thing is somebody made it that way. A system made it that way. It's not just, oh yes, um, we're all living in this type of precarious freedom situation. It was for certain people. Mm -hmm. um, and so I wanted to get, um, if you could uh, read the excerpts, um, from your book, one of the excerpts, the other excerpt with the drama and the scandal, although this excerpt has drama and scandal, um, but <laughs> the other excerpt we're going to do towards the end, but I would love for you to read, um, the excerpt. And I think it actually speaks to, um, that, that topic and really the reality of freedom. Absolutely. So there are kind of four main characters, but I would say there are two protagonists here. Dakarai, who is um, a man from Zimbabwe, who is a Shona sculptor. Um, he gets taken into the trade. His wife, die, who's also a sculptor, dies on the, through, in the Middle Passage in childbirth, and their daughter survives, and her name is Jendai. And so they go through a lot. But um, Dakarai was the first character who showed up for me. And so this is a moment. He is a carpenter and he is someone very respected in his community. Um, but he's also a man who has not been involved uh, for a long time since the death of his wife. And so this is a piece that I will read for you, just an excerpt. Um, that hopefully you'll enjoy. Okay. Can everybody hear? You can hear. Good. Okay. As a slave for Doña Francesca, she is rarely allowed out of her sight. Yet, one day when Michela was sent to offer Padre fresh flowers for the altar from Doña Francesca's garden, she saw the caray and smiled. She smiled because it was the first time in months that she had been able to walk alone to the church without Doña Francesca lamenting about her perceived laziness. So, Michaela strolled with her basket of flowers and enjoyed the hot sun on her head and the grinding rhythm of the stones under her light leather sandals as she experienced a moment of timelessness. She did not even try to pretend that this was a life she could have. But in that exact moment, when she made eye contact with Dakarai as he was coming across the plaza, she had smiled with pure joy, one that made her beauty radiate. And he stopped and smiled back. Shocked, Michaela turned her head as she felt his look sting the blood inside her body. She ducked into the church, murmuring a greeting to Pate and handing him the flowers while trying to ease the pace of her heart. Padre dismissed her with a disinterested blessing, distracted by the other parishioners coming for confession. With a mumbled directive to tell her mistress many thanks, Padre turned quickly and forgot Michaela's presence. Used to sliding into corners, Michaela qu 
quietly left the coolness of the church, all the while thinking of Dakarai. In those days, she too called him Juan Carlos. She did not expect that he would be waiting for her to emerge from the church. He stood by a tree in the forest surrounding the plaza, shaded and alone. Nodding his head, he beckoned her to approach. Gazing around to see who was about, Michaela walked swiftly across the plaza to stand abruptly in front of him. As she drew up to him, his height and frame seemed imposing. She had never been this close to a free black man before. She was only used to being near other enslaved black men when they worked together. And even then their interactions were limited. She smelled the sharp tang of lemongrass on him along with something else earthier as she inhaled deeply. Like many of the other black women who whispered while working on the haciendas of the Spaniards, Michaela had once foolishly dreamed about being enfolded in the arms of this gorgeous man. Amused at herself for just noticing his newly grown beard, which covered his upper lip and chin in an elegant goatee, Michaela could tell that this was a man who took care of his looks. Rumor had it that he was 42, though his broad shoulders tapered into a trim waist and lean legs, giving him the look of a man half his age. The Karai's dark chocolate skin had the ruddy burnish of being out in the sun for a bit too long. At that moment, Michaela could not think of any other in all of Costa Rica who was more beautiful than this man in front of her. He looked her squarely in the eyes and said, Michaela, I'm sorry for disturbing your errands as I know the ways of Doña Francesca. You do not own your time. However, grant me a minute. There's something I would like to say. Dakara leaned into Michaela, speaking softly so only she could hear. And Michaela stood there, a grown woman with lovely mahogany skin, tinged with pink from her walk in the day sun, momentarily reduced to a teenager. She tucked her head into her chest, trying to still her pounding heart, and then slowly looked up again into his eyes. You may speak freely, Juan Carlos. I can tell Doña Francesca that Padre was engaged and I had to wait to give him the gift of flowers. I have a few moments to spare, Michaela whispered. Please call me Dakarai, which is my real name. Juan Carlos is the slave name I was forced to carry and the Panas are too unimaginative to believe I had a life, a name and a history before I was their property. But let me be straight with you so that you see and hear me for who I am. I speak with the deepest respect for you. I am a man dedicated, who dedicated a lifetime to the mother of my daughter. She is now gone 15 years. And during that time, I have been both enslaved and free. I work and raise my daughter and have not thought too much of what the arms of a beautiful woman would feel like after all this time. Today, in seeing you, I have remembered what it means to be held and loved by a woman and my need is now great. I would like to see you, Michaela. I understand what I am asking is a dangerous thing. I cannot offer you freedom, marriage, or a home. However, I can give of myself freely if you will have me. The car I said as he pulled back slowly, shadowed by the tree which shaded them from the eyes of possible onlookers, though the plaza was empty. Michaela felt words bubbling onto her tongue, but could not find the right amount of air to say all that she wanted. She looked into his face and saw the lines of his stories carved along his eyes. He was an exquisite specimen of a man, all muscle and pull, dark brown with a short afro and a poignant and poignant merciful eyes. She caught laughter in them as his mouth curled into a smile when she blushed, letting her know that he enjoyed her admiration of his strong, delicious body. She dared not look below his broad chest to his tapered waist and grounding legs, firmly planted in the earth and telling her that she was safe. Trying to gain control of the color of her cheeks, all Michaela managed to get out was, I will come late tomorrow night to your home in La Cotera. With those words and a smile, she turned quickly and ran towards Doña Francesca's house, 
her heart slamming against her chest with the car ponderous offer. She also felt fearful of Doña Francesca's wrath if anyone had seen her chatting with him under the tree by the plaza. Ooh. I was like, okay, come on now, Natasha. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, yeah, um, speechless, right? Uh, there was a lot of heat there. Um, and there's, there's lots more of those scenes um, in your book. There are a couple of love stories that happen simultaneously throughout the novel. Um, and as you um, describe it, it's a historical fiction. So you imagined um, these stories that, like you said, it's it you. It's very seldom that you get those, um, you know, those stories of agency of what it meant in the day to day. I was particularly preoccupied with the idea of children in the novel. Um, the idea of the separation of the family, the separation of children, um, even having children in the new world, in these colonies. And it's been, it's, you know, from the time I started my documentary where I was reading a lot of these archives and historical documents, and I came upon mothers who would rather their children die um, than live a life of enslavement, that came up. You know, I'm not going to give away the storyline because I would love for everyone in this virtual chat to get a copy. Um, and maybe we could even have a little book club thing going on, especially for scenes like that. I know people are like touch deprived. We, we're not going to get that deep because no. But um, but the idea of having children and how um, how some mothers preferred that their child, you know, and it's not something to prefer, right? It's, why would you prefer that? But the idea of, of your child living in, in death, actually, living in death more freely than they could live in life, in actual life or this, this life, right? And so I wanted um, to ask you, because all of this is, is, is there's trauma here and living trauma. And so I wanted to ask you, what, are, what were some of the difficulties writing this type of historical fiction because it's about Black folks and by extension, it's about yourself. Right. Thank you. Um, that's really interesting that you said it's about myself. So I think if I'm going to start with me, I think that um, I am a romantic, actually. I, I deeply live in love and I deeply believe in love very much so. I'm also someone who is very much loved. I'm partnered, I'm loved by my husband, by my children, by my extended family, by my friends, by all the folks who showed up today and I see all the people. And so I understand and I believe in that concept. Um, and so I think in terms of difficulties, I knew that I wanted to prioritize this concept of of love and of beauty, right? And so I really wanted to have that even in the relationships that I created, in the love relationships that I created, I wanted there to, to be a clear understanding that the most radical and revolutionary thing that could happen in this, in the oppression of slavery and the removal of agency, the removal of freedom, right? Is the fact that people still had the ability to love each other against all odds. And I knew absolutely I was not going to create a replica of any sort of slave narrative that sort of exaggerated, not, not even exaggerated, but what sort of, I mean, and I'm gonna use this in quotes because it's a term, um, slave porn, right? So this concept of, you know, the beaten body, the ravaged black body, the, you know, um, and in many ways, it, it, I'm not saying those things did not happen, what I'm saying is that Costa Rica had a particular unique form of enslavement because there was not a plantation system, right? And the intimacies of violence 
happened so much more, they were so much more personal because you had so much enslavement with people who lived in the house with you, who lived with your owners. The Spaniards in Costa Rica were not rich people. The, Costa Rica was like a backward county, you know, it's sort of the stepchild during that time period because they could not compete with, you know, the sugar cane in Brazil or, or the silver mines in, in South America. And so one of the things I wanted to make sure of is that people understood those difficult choices of, yes, mattress, you know, fem, uh, uh, not matricide, um, is it feminist? No, no. It is when a mother chooses to to kill her child so that she the child does not basically go into enslavement, right? Um, and that is an act of agency. Am I condoning it? Absolutely not. But are we in a position to actually, um, yes, from the from beloved, exactly, Margaret Garner. That's what I'm thinking of, right? Can we? Are we in a position, you know, as we sit on our Zoom call and and you know, and intellectualize, advanced thank you, India, um, about positions that people who were enslaved had to make about their bodies. No, we're not in a position. We can, we can see it, we can talk about it, but we are not essentially in a position um, to then really cast judgment, to throw stones. And so I did not necessarily want, I mean, those are some of the questions that come up, but I am really interested in this idea of, of love and the sacrifices of love and how love is deeply attached to liberation and freedom. I, um, yes, um, yes. I think it's important that, cause we can, we can sit here and say, oh, well, if I were in those times, it's like, you don't know what you, I mean, I, I often talk to Javier about this <laughs> because this is the stuff we talk about. Um, but you know, I'm more prone to say that I would probably poison whoever owned me and then commit suicide. Like I, we speak, we, we, we've been friends for like a decade at this point, but I'm, I'm very, that's how I speak anyway. But I can't, you can kind of imagine, but you can't really imagine the terrors, the horrors, the cruelty of what was happening day to day. Um, and like you said, Costa Rica was, a, you know, they use, and I think you use the term, and I also heard the term used elsewhere, this backwater um, location. Um, and so, you know, the, the, the Spaniards are making their little, little, you know, fingers, finger kingdom, however they could, right? Because they, they wanted to compete, but they couldn't. Um, and so that was particularly interesting, the interactions with the Spaniards in the book. And we spoke about the use of the word fania, which I use very often, um, but it was a word that is some resistance against that colonial order. It's a disparaging word to, re to refer to the Spaniards in colonial times and by extension, um, the ruling classes or the mestizos in Central America, Black people throughout Central America use that word. Um, and I was just, I, I was kind of delighted not gonna lie, I was delighted by it. Um, because throughout the book, yes, you do paint the picture of, of the day-to-day -day violence, but you also paint the picture of the day-to-day -day resistance and the will to live and the inter or rather intra community communication that black folks have amongst ourselves. You know, the look that we have, the look that we give one another, the, the, the lingo that we use, the words that we use. Um, and like you said, that that slave porn that is so um, ubiquitous. I Reading your novel was kind of a, a reprieve from that because I think that there's something to be said about the imagination and this, this idea or this notion or the practice of leaning into the grotesque that I find really abusive and, and re-traumatizing every time I read certain narratives. And I just kind of felt, I felt like I was in the story because it was a lot of that day to day. Well, no, we're not even gonna talk about this. No, we're not, we're, you know, you can't trust the Spaniards. 
you know that they're slippery, you know that they break their promises or rather they have no humanity. And these are conversations that black folks have amongst ourselves. And this is this is pretty much normal conversation that we have. And I was like, it, I, it felt really hu humanizing to finally see what we, we say in private and what we know to be true on the pages of this, this, um, these stories that you were crafting, um, was that some of your intention to be like, actually, we have our own stuff going on. Like we have our own thing going on. Well, I mean, I, you know, so I come from the training and legacy of, of black women writers. Right. And so Toni Morrison always said, you know, I, I'm writing a Black world. It's the, it's the interior world of Blackness, and I do not have to pander. I don't have to create other characters because this is the world that I know, and this is, you know, the world. These are the characters who speak to me. And so it, there was no intentionality behind, like, I am going to specifically write, you know, a book this way. Um, I knew that I wanted, I knew that the Karai was the leading character. He was someone that that showed up very early for me, and I needed to. And he was also someone that I met um, when he was in Africa, right? So he was the first time, you know, when I thought about this character, he was this Shona sculptor um, in Zimbabwe. And so, because I've been to Zimbabwe, I've lived in South Africa. These are not places that I have conjured and you know I can look on a map. I've been in those physical spaces, right? I mean, not the ancient spaces, but I've been in the, I've walked that land. And so it was not hard for me to create something that was authentic and was not like fairy tale Africa, motherland. I mean, like, you know, I mean, everybody has their needs. I'm not, you know, disparaging anybody who, who needs to have that particular narrative, but that wasn't my story. I mean, I have been in and out of Africa for almost 30 years, right? And so, it just felt really natural to have his story show up. Um, and then he led the way to the other characters, you know, his daughter, the neighbor, um, the woman that he loves, he falls in love with, um, his, his dead wife, you know, I mean, all these relationships that he creates and he serves as this leading character in the community of free Blacks. Um, and he, you know, and, and he's flawed too. And I think that's why I liked him the most, you know. I wanted to show the complexity around a black man, um, around a man that was incredibly talented, that was well respected, um, and 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 to show and was uh, and was loving, right? And was loving to his daughter and was emotional. I wanted, I really wanted to to show that um, because I've had other examples, you know, of of beautiful, of beautiful black men who've shown up in other texts, you know? So, and I, so I wanted to kind of step outside of these ideas, these stereotypes uh, of, and the limitations of what could happen to black humanity in the text. And so going, I love that because it's, again, I, I always say the black normalcy from, it's the black normalcy for me, the black normativity. This is, this is just what it is. These are our lives, our interior lives. This is, this is the norm here. Um, and I love that. Um, going, going um, more into the characters, you said, I want to speak a little bit about the characters. So you had Zakari, who is the, you know, the patriarch of um, the story. And he has his, and the thing is he has his love story with um, Micaela, but he also has his love story with his, um, his wife that passed, um, uh, Toela, mm -hmm. and also his love story with his daughter in the sense of the, you know, as a father, it doesn't, please don't get the wrong idea, but it's, it's in the sense of a father figure and that love that um, Jindai was actually negotiating with him that she's like, hey, like I'm, I'm growing up and I want, I want to know that, that story between you and my, my mom. Um, and also the love story with Esmeralda and, and her and what she gave of herself, that, that was multiple love stories in and of itself. I really identified with that character because I mean, yes, the scandal and y'all gonna have to read for the, the actual, I was like, yes. <laughs> 
Yes, you know, um, you know, uh, uh, what is it? Um, um, what the fine print? I'm I'm the daughter of Oya, who was a warrior. So this is is there was some stuff happening that Esmeralda orchestrated. I was like, yes. Um, but yes, can we talk a little bit about um, some of those characters that you developed? As I said, Zakara was the first one um, who came in. In actuality, the book is, um, well, let, me, let me step back a little bit. So I spent about seven years doing research for this book. So it is deeply based in historical accuracy, right? Literally, I went to the archives and I found lists of Costa Rican families, colonial Costa Rican families with the list of their enslaved people along with their cattle and their other, you know, other property, right? And so the, these are not fictional in terms of the, the, the setting of the space. Um, and so I, I originally had written the story through four points of view, right? So it was the Karai, his daughter, Jandai, Michaela, who's his lover, and Esmeralda. And Esmeralda is a slave of the Catholic Church. She's an enslaved person. The Catholic Church owns her. And she is, um, she's blind in one eye and one arm has been burnt badly, right? But she's the one who has to clean the altar and sort of maintain the cleanliness of, of the church. And I'm not giving anything else away. However, um, the, and, and so what happened is in the process of writing, um, the editor at the press, Jaded Ibis, where I, um, that's publishing the book, they, we had a conversation about sort of moving everything into the third person except Esmeralda. So Esmeralda sort of becomes the thread through the entire book. It's her eye that carries us, right? Um, and so, and, and that for me actually felt very important because actually how I wrote it was Originally, all Esmeralda's commentary was in italics, right? Throughout, like when I originally wrote it. And so there was a distinction I was trying to make and they were, the press was able to pick it up and they were actually able to help me kind of weave the perspective so that the only eye that shows up, the first person narrative is, is through Esmeralda's. And so, yes, Dash, you're right. There is definitely a moment of redemption um, that happens for this enslaved woman who is owned by the church for 35 years. And, 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 and what I was basically trying to sort of wave a flag at was the fact that the Catholic church, as you said earlier, is one of the largest um, owners of enslaved persons, you know, um, through this, this, um, the, the slavery experience, right? And I think that I say experience because it, in many ways it's prolonged, right? We still live inside the legacy of it. And in many ways, we still, we still bear the burdens of, of plantation politics and all the stuff that happened. I think we still, that's still written upon our bodies um, today in the 21st century. And so these characters for me, um, we're really in conversation. They just kind of showed up. So I do, I have to say this, right? I am formally trained as an academic. I have a degree, I have a, a doctorate in English. I teach literature, I teach writing. It's the thing I've been doing for 25 years. I know how to do that. Um, I do not have an MFA. I have never taken a course ever. I'm admitting it now. I've never taken a course on writing, like creative writing. I've never done that. Um, and so I set out to write a book, a historical fiction book, because I love historical fiction. I love getting, doing the research because I'm trained to do research um, and then using creativity as a way to sort of bridge the gap, right? And literally, I have to say the book that I, that I started writing seven years ago with the, you know, with all the history is probably about 95% of what's being published today outside of just changing the point of views, right? So instead of the four I point of views, it was shifted to three of them meant, went into the third person. But outside of that, in terms of the story, um, the press really, they wanted it, like just how it was, you know? I mean, obviously there were some grammar things to clean up, but in terms of the overall structure, the narrative, where it, be, where it began, the middle and the end, 
um, yeah, that was it. And I, I don't have any remedy. Like don't, no one needs to follow me in terms of writing. I don't, you know, I am not a journal writer. And I know that like Michelle writes her journal so beautifully and I'm always admiring her journal writing. Um, I am not that person. I literally, you know, produce a couple of sentences here and there. And, um, you know, usually when I write, it's sort of like, okay, you know, I've, I can sit down, I can write 20 pages and then, you know, that 20 page and I get up and maybe three weeks later, I'm writing another 20 pages. So in, life is very busy for me, right? And in the process, I'm really grateful that I was able to produce this book because it means a lot to me. It's so funny, not to interrupt, but it's so funny that you're like, well, the book is published. I can spill all my tea. I didn't take no writing course. I didn't do no type of workshop. No, I'm, I'm kidding. But I think it, no, but I, I think it also speaks to um, those parameters that allow gatekeeping, right? Like, why, why do you got to take 500 creative writing courses? Like, if you're an actual, if you have that talent and skill and you want to do it, like, why not, you know, start writing it and start research or whatever it is? Um, because we know we know those ins and outs of academia, right? And and it and it is to gatekeep. It is to gatekeep these stories out. Um, and the fact that you said that you um, and I was chuckling when you said you know the motherland, like you you don't need that. Um, there are people who do need it, and I I think that's important to note that. Um, I'm on that same wave with you that Africa is a continent of over 50 countries and it is what it is. Um, I don't believe or feel that, I, yes, things were lost, but I also think a lot of things were created. Um, and I tend to focus on the creations uh, because what has been lost, we, we may recover and we probably are rec recovering it right now. We're probably recovering it right in this virtual chat right now. Um, and I think it's important to always, um, to, to not always concentrate on that deficit. And that's why that imagination piece is so important and why I, I really love how you, how you constructed this world um, out of your lived experiences, out of the archives, um, that intentionality in the archives to look and, you know, I, I don't want to speak for you, um, but it seems as though, and that's what it came across to me, at least, that there was an intentionality with those characters um, and how you built them. And if you don't mind, um, we have about 20 minutes left and we will have time for Q&A, but I want to get to the other excerpt, <laughs> the other excerpt that I was like, oh, Dr. Natasha uh, Gordon Chippery has to read this part because I, I gasped. I audibly gasped in my bed with my little, you know, midnight wine. <laughs> I was like, no, 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 you got to read this one. <laughs> okay, this is, this is for you because you requested it. So this, um, so this is a conversation between Dakarai and Jendai. And this is probably in the last 20 pages of the book. So it doesn't give away, it doesn't give away too much, but yeah, no, no, it doesn't give away too much. Okay. Tuesday evening. I just do not understand how he can be so disrespectful as to approach you with such a message for me, Dakarai says, pacing in Jendai's bedroom. She has begged him for a moment of his time, and when he joins her, she is shocked at how he has aged. Gone are the all black curls in his hair. His face is now framed with gray. His goatee has gray edges as well. It feels like she has not lied when she told Don Jimenez that her father was ill. Indeed, his body shows an illness of spirit. Baba, too many days have passed now and your absence is becoming a conversation. You need to resolve with them over your payment for the Ibarra work. But nothing can be done until we follow Tia Petronella's plan. Now that Michaela is stronger, she must leave tomorrow night. Mama has arranged for two guides to walk along with her. But the men cannot wait forever. I know they are trustworthy, Jendai says. If she is to go, then she needs more herbs to take with her to strengthen her blood. 
I feel that she is still too weak and she does not speak to me, so I cannot really assess her abilities. I have no more tea, and so you must go to Mama Esmeralda this evening and ask for them. I have always told you to leave her alone and not trouble her space because there is much at risk, but tonight, daughter, I go against my own words in order to get help, Takara says wearily. Esmeralda, Baba, that's so far. The rains are very heavy. I'm sure Tio Petronella has some I can beg a bit from. Should I go there? Jandai protests. Sorry. No, Jandai. Only Esmeralda has the special tea that she has made to care for Michaela. I know I am asking much from you, but tonight there is no going against my word if we are to make sure Michaela leaves in safety. I cannot risk being seen since I have told everyone that I'm ill and in bed, Dakara says, a strange pleading in his voice. And so, resentful of having to go into the blinding rain, sharp with run rumbling thunder and lightning that makes the night into day, Jendai wraps her body in her day shawl, covers her head with a farmer's hat, knowing it will only shield her eyes in order to see the few steps in front of her as she makes her way past the Cruz de Caravaca and to the church plaza. The candles on the altar are humming bright. The rain pelts the tile steps. Jendai notes that oddly, the church doors are ajar, though there is no special mass that evening. Assuming that Esmeralda is cleaning instead of going directly to her shed, Jandai dashes up the slippery steps into the vestibule, not bothering to touch her head with holy water at the font. She calls out but does not hear or see anyone. The whirling storm makes music around her and it feels strangely safe standing inside though she is dripping wet. A sudden bolt of thunder and a flash of lightning illuminates the room, slamming one of the front doors closed and outing several candles on the altar. Jumping with fright, Jandai remembers Josefina's story of the dead brother, one who remains pleading for forgiveness night after night. Overcome with an ominous feeling, she shakes herself, remembering her errand, and makes her way through the nave, genuflecting hesitantly, as if Padre will show up any second to scold her for not showing the required respect. Crossing the altar and walking out the side door towards the schoolroom and Esmeralda's dilapidated shack, Jandai struggles as the rain slashes across her face once she's back outside. The brief respite inside the church has been a foolish choice on her part, because now the chill racks her spine as her wet clothes cling to her skin. Knocking lightly at first on the tin door, Jandai hears some movement inside, though with the storm around her, it is hard to discern. Sure that Esmeralda is inside, Jandai pushes the door open, calling out softly that it is her. Another muffling sound reaches her as she eases inside from the rain and pulls the door shut behind her. When she turns to focus her eyes in the dark, lightning illuminates the small room and the acrid smell of blood overwhelms her. Oh, no, 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 Mama Esmeralda. Jandai screams into the storm and the room and the blood and the pain that she sees in front of her. Dun, dun, dun. And that is what leads to when I was like, yes. Um, but yeah, that's just, you know, clap it up, clap it up. Um, is someone is Ugo's already asking what where they can um where she can purchase the book. Um, I have your your website in the chat. Um, yeah, where can we purchase the book? When can we purchase the book? So we could put it on our calendars, right? Put it on all our calendars, our alarms. Um, yeah, where can we get that? So the book should be the pre-sale link should be out this weekend, and it will be on social media. It'll be on my website. It will be Facebook. Um, and then on Jaded, Jaded Ibis's social media. And then the physical book will be in stores throughout the United States and the UK um, on the 13th of September. So in about two weeks. So two days copy. after my birthday. So, you know, treat yourself for my birthday, treat yourself to the book. Um, but, but yeah, I think it was, pro, it was, um, really profound that you wrote the book through Esmer Esmeralda's eyes, um, because she was, 
you know, and we, we were not going to play a Prussian Olympics, but she was the most abused. Um, this was someone who is a dark skinned black woman who is enslaved to the church, um, who had experienced so much loss in her life that she was the one, you know, I, and I feel like once again, to save everyone, right? And I feel actually really that she she was La Negrita, that Esmeralda was the one. And she's just what, she's a symbol really for um, all of those um, Black folks, specifically Black women who, who do that, <laughs> you know, who, who, who do that every single day and who have been doing that and who have carried us through. Um, and so today is a, is a particularly um, specific day, August 31st, is um, Dia de la Persona Negra in, in Costa Rica. August was Afro Costa Rican month um, and also in El Salvador too. Um, <laughs> Javier's excited with all those exclamation points, Javier, <laughs> calm down. Um, no, I'm kidding. You should be excited. It's a great book. Um, Ricardo asks, will it also be on Audible at some point? Perhaps. I mean, that's down the road. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Shadi goes, we gonna be looking. <laughs> Shadi always looking. You always looking, girl. Like, um, shout out Desiree. Hey, Desiree, we ready. Um, do we have, and you know, I want to open the, the floor for the, um, you know, the last segments of uh, the program. And also Javier, um, if you want to chime in, does anyone have any questions around um, this spectacular book that's coming out? Any particular questions to Dr. Natasha Gordon Chippenberry? Um, please unmute and let's get it going. Ah, Felipe asked, will it be available in bookstores in Costa Rica? That's yes, a it will be in the Liberia, um, but probably by the end of October because they have to be shipped from the U.S. Oh, actually, I'm asking for myself, will it be books in bookstores in Panama? Because that's the other thing. Um, I will see. I don't know. I mean, if there are, then it probably it's something that has to be requested. Right. So if you went in, they could probably get a couple of oh, I'm gonna go in. Right. Don't worry about it. I'm gonna go in. Right. Um, and you can also, you know, count on me if you need me to bring books here, like whatever you whatever you need. Thank um, you. but yeah, um, if yeah, you can un whoever has a question, comment, um, please unmute um and state your case. Oh, never mind. Go ahead, Shadi. I just wanted to ask about like um I think you used IBIS. Um, so I was wondering, like, what was your experience? Like, if you worked with other Black women in editing and, like, publishing your work? And, like, what did that look like in terms of, like, people understanding what it was you were actually trying to say versus thinking, like, it wasn't important or, like, using the word interesting or, like, not really, like, understanding what it was that you were trying to create? Thank you. That's such a great question. And to be honest, yeah, I had a really tough time. Like they were like, black people, Costa Rica, what? Puerto Rico? Right. And it was like, if it was not a story of like Brazil or Cuba in terms of Latin America, people were like, no, we don't get it. Black people in Costa Rica, what are you, what are you talking about? And, and slavery, like mix that in. And so it was really interesting. What happened was I had about two years. I was sending out queries to people, sending out sample chapters. I was getting those form letters, right? Form letters, like, no, 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 we're passing, we're passing, we're passing. And I was just like, okay. And then... Actually, um, I went to undergrad at Vassar and there was, a, I did an alum event. Like I was just part of a conversation with my class and, um, and this was during COVID. Well, one of the people, um, a, a classmate basically was like, I work at this literary agency that's run by this black woman and I'd love to take in your book. And so basically what happened was he sort of brought me to the top and what she did was because she was, because I'm, I don't have 90,000 followers and I don't have 50,000 books and I'm not a celebrity. Um, and I'm pretty much an academic with an academic publication background. Um, she pushed me off to her white assistant 
who, which, and it was a fairly traumatic experience for me, who after months and months of her sort of piping me along, um, dropped me, you know? And one of the things I did was one night, literally when I got that, like, you know, these people are not treating me properly. I got on this private Facebook group. Um, it's like writers of color looking for literary agents, right? Um, and this woman, you know, I sort of summarized without naming people. I did not, you know, call anybody out, but I was like, look, this is my experience. And like, how do I recover from this? And this black woman by the name of Lisa Pegram, who I love, wrote me privately at like midnight. And you, I mean, for those who know, I'm in bed at nine o'clock, so midnight. And I was like, I must've been traumatized if I was reading Facebook at midnight. And she was like, you know, I'm an acquisition editor at Jaded Ibis Press, which is a feminist press in California that is specifically dedicated to amplifying women's voices. And I would love to read your book. She, and I sent her the book and three days later, she was like, you're gonna be in contract. I'm, I'm taking this book. And it's, been, it's literally from that moment and she got every single thing. She's a black woman in the world. Um, she, is, she, she also made her own exit out of the United States. She's from the East Coast, but she now lives in the Caribbean because she wanted to create some other choices for herself. Um, and she's just been an incredible support system, but she got it. And she didn't change my work. That was the other thing. I didn't have to pander. I didn't have to change characters. It was just, it was perfect from beginning to end. And so one of the things, um, I don't know, a lot of folks know this about me, but uh, during COVID, I got a scholarship to actually train to be a yoga teacher. That's how I survived COVID. COVID. So one of the things is I have like a yoga mat and, and a cloth that, that is my favorite quote, um, which is from The Alchemist, which one one of my favorite books that basically says, you know, when you want something genuinely with your heart, the universe will conspire to, to make it happen. And every single day when I was doing yoga, I was just like, I need to find the right press and the right people, the people who get it, who will not have me, you know, whiten my books, who will not have me change my voice, who will not have me destroy any other characters, because I love these characters. I love them. And, you know, and I had to journey with them. Um, and I found that I found that with this press and I found this, you know, with, with Lisa and they have now created a whole publicity, um, you know, project for me, a speaking project for me that goes all the way into the spring. I mean, it's, it's fantastic. So yeah, after a lot of bad situations, I had a great time with Jaded Ibis and I, you know, I would recommend them. They are a small press, but they do, they do you right. Meaning they, they are very um, invested. You know, I get folks are in the office on Sundays working and I'm like, it's Sunday. I thought I was the only one working on Sunday, but folks are working on Sunday. I was like, okay, I respect this. And then we all need to take breaks too, right? That's the other thing, but still. Thank you for that. I think like, how do I recover from this is such like an apt like phrase to describe like that process. Cause you wrote something that was like very sensual, very evocative, very intimate. And then to like bring that, who you bring that in front of can definitely even shape your course as a writer in the future and like make you put your pen down. So that's like really, I think a powerful journey. So thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Shadi, you always come through. You just come to all our events because you just come through co-facilitating and all that. Um, thank you for that question. Um, like Evelyn said, shout out Evelyn, E-V-E. -E. When it's for you, there is ease. And so, like you said, they they treated you right. Um, and I, I couldn't imagine um, watering down or diluting these characters um, because, you know, <laughs> you know the cliche, like, oh, I see myself. You know, I see myself. I like I was probably a little cliche. I was like, I see myself <laughs> in these pages. <laughs> um, do we have um Shadi, is that an old hand or you wanna um say um something else? That might be an old hand. Um uh, I have something. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh it was amazing listening to the episode. And thank you, Shadi, for that question. I think it was a, a, a great question. So I just have a brief question. 
Um, so where do you imagine or see this book, which I think is amazing, the way that you're bringing life to these enslaved people and other people that are living adjacent to enslaved people are, and still come of that legacy within the literary canon of Costa Rica. And particularly as it, re as it relates to the national narrative and the national canon and the canon of, canon of black writers in, in Costa Rica. It's like, where do you see La Negrita, finding La Negrita, La, La Negrita doing work in that space? And does it have access points into educational spaces to rethink these narratives associated with, with La Virgen de Los Angeles and all the other characters in this community of people being that it's historical fiction. Um, so I don't know if you could speak to that a bit because I think it holds a lot for the national audience and, and, and other people surrounding. That's a good question. To be honest, um, I'm not sure I can answer that in terms of my intent. So when I think about this book, I think that it is sort of an intersection on thinking about um, literature that deals with slavery, you know, and the Black Atlantic. And I'm thinking that it's part of not Costa Rica specific or even Central America specific, but part of sort of the Black narratives, right? And, and so that's sort of where I am thinking about this book. So, um, you know, thinking about Edris Dandy Katz, uh, the farming of bones, right? And thinking about, you know, the Haitian massacre of 1937. Um, so I, I imagine that my book could sit someplace alongside those types of historical fiction where you're looking at moments, but it's really the story of blackness that you that's being amplified, right? So it's not specific to Costa Rica, but it, but it is an opening into Costa Rica. Um, in terms of Costa Rican literature, there are um, very few writers in English in Costa Rica. Um, a lot of the writers obviously are, are Spanish speaking. I mean, Afro Costa Ricans who are, you know, they write in Spanish. And so one of the agreements that I have with my press is that, you know, eventually after X amount of sales, they will then commission um, a, a writer of my choice, um, actually a black woman, um, who is a Spanish professor and who does work on Afro-Costa Rican literature to actually translate the book into Spanish, right? Because then it enters a different kind of conversation. Um, and so because that hasn't happened yet, I am sort of looking at this book as a, as a space, not necessarily inside Costa Rica in terms of conversation, even though I do have, you know, a lot of people who are interested in it here and who are very supportive of it. Um, but I'm, I'm more interested in going to the world, sort of like, and here is Costa Rica, and there's an important story here, because actually Costa Rica is, I mean, my understanding is Costa Rica is like number two or three in terms of destination spots right now in terms of the travel industry. Everybody's trying to come to Costa Rica. You know, the, the nomad visa has just been approved by the new government. Um, there are lots of people leaving you know, the United States, and many of them are resettling in Costa Rica, or they're traveling through, right, in, in, in unprecedented numbers. Um, and so for me, because Costa Rica is now not Puerto Rico, right, because everybody was like, oh, you live on a beach, you know, you're drinking coconut water every day, and you're in Puerto Rico, and you're on an island. That, I mean, for years, I had family members still who were like, you're on an island, right? I'm like, where are you thinking that I am? You know, <laughs> I'm like, I am working. I like, how is this possible? So for me, I think it's a, it's an intervention in yes, Costa Rican history, but it's more of an awakening of Costa Rica as a place, as a historical space, as a space that had black legacy for me in the world, right? So it's an opening of a conversation globally more so than, um, yes, it's a conversation that I can have in Costa Rica as well. Um, I mean, and and I mean, I know I'm sure that there are some people who will teach it at the university, right? But as I said, it's in English. And so I think, I mean, your question is really important for me, but I've always presented it. I always thought that it's a it's a book that will be in the world. I actually really love that Costa Rica as a historical and contemporary space, place, and location of blackness. That's what we're talking about, right? And it's 
if the if the Costa Ricans get something out of that, or rather non-black Costa Ricans get something out of that, good for you, baby. But you were you are writing about the the black experiences, and I appreciate um, we appreciate you for that. And thank you so much for coming on to this virtual chat. As you said, like you're gonna be like doing your whole tour, and so we caught you early. <laughs> Um, caught you early before the whirlwind, um, but you actually will be doing a, a chat with me again. Hey, um, <laughs> September, I believe September twelfth or the week of September twelfth um, on R twenty nine Somos, and I'll also tweet that out. And you, of course, know when the link, the pre order link comes out, I'll be tweeting that. We'll be putting it on our Afro Latino travel social media accounts. Um, so please follow us, follow Dr. Natasha Gordon Chippenberry, um, and thank y'all for, for attending and please attend our future, um, our future events, um, because we bring, we, you know, we bring all this goodness to you, like don't sleep. So, um, if we have, and actually, um, we, we have to end it cause, cause we have to end it, <laughs> but, um, thank y'all so much for coming through. Um, and hope to see y'all again. And, you know, y'all are repeat, repeat offenders with our events. I love it. Thank you for all your support. Um, any closing words, Dr. Deacon, Javier Wallace, Pastor Wallace. <laughs> Let the church say amen and pass the collection plate before we go. Right. Uh, <laughs> for the book. To buy the book. For the book, amen. For the book. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> thank you all so much it's an honor yeah because you know i'm gonna come through that retreat you know just see what's going on bypass that wait list but good night y'all <laughs> <laughs> good night everybody thank you <laughs> bye